Welcome to the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. I'm your host, Jacob Cooper, best-selling author of Life After Breath and the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. For those of you who are new to my channel, please consider hitting that subscribe button as well as bell notification icon to stay up to date to weekly podcasts and interviews coming your way, as well as sharing your thoughts within the comments section below. Today's guest on the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder is Katie Beecher. Katie is an author, medical intuitive, She's also a fellow counselor. She's, she's going to be sharing her own tips from a medical intuitive standpoint, her transformative journey, as well as mental health and physical health tips as well, too, on, on our interview. So I'm looking forward to our conversation with Katie. I know many will get a lot of helpful information from this conversation. So without further ado, we bring on Katie Beecher on the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. Katie Beecher it is my distinct honor to have you here as my guest in the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for inviting me, and it's great to meet you finally, virtually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know certainly we're in similar circles and, you know, we're on social media, but I, I'm certainly a big fan of your work, and it's impacted, I'm sure, countless lives. But for those of my viewers who haven't heard of Katie Beecher, can you tell us a little bit about you know, yourself and the current work that you're doing, because it is incredibly transformative, you know, from what I've seen. And obviously, we'll talk a little bit about that beautiful book, Heal From Within, you know, right behind you as well. But, you know, I'll leave you the floor. Sure. Um, so I'm a licensed professional counselor and a, I like to call myself a physical and emotional intuitive, uh, mental, I mean, medical and emotional intuitive, because my work really hits on like physical, emotional, and spiritual stuff. So it runs the gamut. Um, big fan of root cause healing and things like that because so many people present to me with a physical symptom or emotional symptom. And then my guides will reveal all of this other stuff, you know, with their life, either currently or in the past. And they don't realize how related it is. So that's a big part of my work. Um, I create a four page report and an intuitive soul painting, just knowing someone's name and age, ideally. Yeah. Um, I like to know as little as possible because the more I know, the more I can get in the way of my guides and you know, possibly interpret things or come to conclusions that are not necessarily accurate. Um, but yeah, that's a big part of what I do. I send the report and painting before we meet. And then when I meet with people, we go over that. Um, they get to ask questions. Um, I try to provide at least some concrete steps that they can have moving forward. And then supplements and some physical stuff. Not a doctor can't diagnose, but I do have people I trust that I can refer to, you know, for, to confirm what I've picked up um, and then do the medical part of the treatment if it's needed. So, um, yeah, I started out a um, very long time, about 35 years ago doing this work, started as a licensed counselor, and it all stemmed from having a really severe eating disorder in my teens. I was throwing up three times a day. It's pretty gross, but it's not. It's what people do. You know, it's reality. And was suicidal, had a plan, um, and I ended up just calling our pediatrician when I was 16 years old without telling my parents and was very determined to get better. So I really call that divine intervention and um, found a Jungian psychologist. She helped me connect to my intuition and love myself more and, and do all the things. And at that point I also knew I was going to write my book. It took me a while to get there, but that's what they, my guys told me at the time. So that's me in a nutshell. Wow. So, a lot of a lot of layers there from the personal and the professional, but it does seem in a way that your pain has really been a big influence on your purpose, it seems. And is that kind of your why? Like why you do the way that you know, kind of your past is a framework to understand and to be very invigorated to help out someone who might have been going through, you know, that kind of dark night that you were in? Absolutely. I really consider that time to be such an important gift. And I'm not going to lie, recovering from an eating disorder was the hardest thing I've ever done. And I've had a lot of challenges. So 
I'm not going to pretend it was easy, but it was absolutely essential to me, even separating from my dysfunctional family, you know, getting to know myself and learning all of these tools and things that I could then um, go on to help other people with. So, so I knew at the time there was a purpose for it, you know? Um, so yeah, absolutely. It was a motivation for, again, for the book to show people that you can get through a lot of really nasty, difficult stuff and come out the other side. Yeah. Like Louis Hay says, you could heal your own life. And, you know, certainly it seems like you've tr certainly not only turned the corner, but you've taken on many people, you know, in your car with you on that healing journey. Um, you know, it's, it's remarkable. Now, you know, you have mentioned a very key component that, you know, mental health, physical health, spiritual health does not operate in silos. Right. Um, could you speak to how, you know, all of our well-being influences and maybe bleeds over or interrelates itself, you know, to each other? Yeah. Um, and for me, it starts with the report, which is broken down into chakras, so energy centers in the body. And I don't really talk about um, changing the energy in those per se. It's more looking at every area of the body physically, emotionally, and spiritually to make sure I kind of cover everything. But for example, somebody will, you know, maybe present with, with symptoms, um, chronic illness or, or something like that. So my guides will identify those symptoms, but then they'll also bring up things like, hey, are you in a job that you hate? Or are you not setting boundaries? Are you doing everything for everybody else? Is your you know, marriage unhappy? All of these things. And those are the harder things to look at. You know, So sometimes when I bring things like that up, people get angry or they think that I am diminishing their physical symptoms in some way. Uh, that happens on social media a lot. And I'm not at all. All of that stuff is real. But even if you think about it in terms of cortisol, the more stressed we are, the more cortisol you produce, the more inflammation. So just from that point of view, mm -hmm. but you know, it's really hard to love yourself and feel good about yourself and do self care when you're unhappy, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of that stuff gets stored and then gets stored up and isn't released physically either. So you know, the body keeps the score stuff is is real. I talk about that a lot in my book. And certainly that's a large part of why movement is such an important part of my life, too. You're talking about physical movement. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm hearing a lot about that. I mean, certainly I'm a student of brain health, influencing mental health and the works of Dr. Daniel M. Main. But for my viewers... Could you maybe talk a little bit about movement therapy and why that's important, um, maybe scientifically, neuroscientifically, or psychologically, um, just kind of give a little bit of tidbits on movement, because I, I think in the spiritual community, people think that you just have to kind of sit there, meditate, don't be active, don't, you know, be engaged, just, you know, whatever. But it seems for you that movement is so crucial, but maybe talk a little bit more about movement and why it's helpful. So there's so many reasons why one is symbolism. We, ex we experience trauma and events, not just in our head, but in our, in our entire body. So it really is a, a symbolic sort of event every time we go through things. And it changes our DNA. It changes our energy. It does all sorts of things to our body. So just doing something like talk therapy, which is really also very valuable, it only scratches the surface because it doesn't get down into the, the cells and the cell memory and things like that. So for me, the, the activity that I choose is um, pole sport, pole dance. Mm -hmm. And I, it's become an addiction in a good way. I go about you know six to eight hours a week and have a pole at home. And I actually competed a couple of years ago in, in one wow. category. So for me, it's been an amazing way to release stress, to get to know my body. So to be in my body, if you're in your body, you can listen to the signals and it lets you know, you know, what you need to do to heal. It's been great for body image, somebody 
you know, with an eating disorder who basically has to wear a bikini to stick to the pole in front of other people. Um, you know, so there's been that whole transformation. Just the physical strength, I think physically when you feel better, you feel, and stronger, you feel more empowered. You know, you, you're you more equipped to take care of yourself if there's a crisis, if you're faced with a dangerous person, things like that. So, so just for me, those are just some of the ways that um, it's helped me. And also just, there's so many people who are isolated and don't feel like they have a community. Mm-hmm. And so when we moved to Jacksonville, I didn't know anyone. And that's where my friends are, you know, my support group, my, and I have an amazing husband and stuff, but, um, but that's where I found my people too. So it just has so many benefits and the older you get, the less you move, the stiffer you get, and then the worse you're going to feel. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you look at two, you know, people, person A versus person B, as they're getting older, the person that's moving, that's active, that's doing crossword puzzles, that's using their brain, are tending to age a lot better versus those that don't. And certainly there's a whole whole neuro uh, basis for that. But even they found, like from what I've studied through Dr. Daniel Amen's work, simple things like ping pong or racket sports, again, activate parts of the brain that help people focus, retain memory. So some things like we wouldn't think. But back to you, I mean, it seems like for for viewers that you've really highlighted the value of what we know as exposure therapy, which is, you know, once we're able to really enter that darkness or greatest fears is when we're able to reframe it and have a better relationship, not avoid it. And it seemed like for you, like this particular exercise has really allowed you to have a new repair dynamic with your uh, body, which is great. But would you say everyone physically is wired differently and may require you know, person A, swimming might be better for them. Person B, you know, running. I mean, I'm a big long distance runner. Would you say like everyone has their own engine from what you found? Oh my God, definitely. Like, I don't expect people to, you know, see what I do and be able to do that. And um, it's amazing when people say that I'm, I've inspired them and like younger people at the pole studio, you know, that's, that's really cool. But um, but no, definitely. And there's there's exercises or movement that like I am not not a good runner. <laughs> it's not something I'm good at. I, I run weird, like my feet do weird things. Um, so that's not really my thing. I think it's amazing for people who can do that, right? Um, but I think a really essential component of movement is that you do something fun. Mm-hmm that you find something you enjoy. Yeah. And like, this is the first time that I've done movement that wasn't associated with weight or how many calories I had that day or mm. size, you know, it's just pure joy. And there's all these great side effects, but if you don't enjoy it, you're not gonna do it. And so I try to tell people, even if you are in bed, you know, even if you're in pain, um, movement is really important. And maybe you get one of those, things that you sit on a desk and, you know, move your hands like that or a little thing you can do with your feet or just do something. It doesn't matter what, but, you know, movement really makes all the difference. Yeah. And and I think there's a lot of trauma that people go through in gym class or on sports teams Mm -hmm. and having the sense of identity saying, well, I wasn't the popular athlete, so I can't be one. And, you know, for me as a kid, I was always very overweight. And I said, like, I can't Mm -hmm. be a runner. I can't, you know, run or whatever. And once I was able to just like do it, I just saw like, this is something that I could be like everyone I think has an inner athlete in them. Just I have to find something that kind of sticks with you. And you have to kind of take away a lot of those belief systems that say that I'm not this, I'm not that, you Mm -hmm. know? So it's amazing how everyone in their own way, and especially now with pickleball, you know, that I'm noticing where it's like people who don't see themselves as athletes are all of a sudden becoming one. So I'm a firm believer that anyone at their own level could find their athleticism and, you know, their strength and resilience, and it could be a great model on and off whatever you're doing. Yeah. And I have, I have a chronic disease. I don't like to put it that way because I don't think of myself in that way, but I have something called um, hypermobility Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder where your connective tissue is inflamed. Um, affects every part of the body. I read a lot about it on my Instagram and stuff. 
But if I did not do the exercise and stretching and strengthening that I do, I would be in so much pain and just be so, like my mental health would be effective. It revs up the nervous system. So another way exercise works. So for me, um, I understand what it's like to have something chronic and to still have those challenges and to know that you can fit, you know, anything in that works for you. Yeah. And even today they're doing chair yoga. You know, I think there's like modified yes. movements for people who maybe, you know, have some physical, you know, totally. barriers or impairments. So, you know, my hope is everyone could find a little bit of flow, a little bit of movement and just to kind of extend that elasticity. But back to you. I mean, I know you mentioned certainly a lot to unfold and impact, but you mentioned that you speak to or communicate with your guides, or as we know, you know, some people call spirit guides, a lot of cultures referred to as guardian angels. How did, when did that moment, you know, come to you and how did that all transpire? I remember being very, very little, like three years old. And oh. my parents were having a fight about eggs. It was something stupid. And um, I remember looking up at them and, and hearing this voice that said, they are not equipped to raise you. You're on your own. Wow. So that's just a, a concrete memory I have. But I know that, you know, my mom would tell me that I would talk to imaginary friends and and all that kind of stuff. So I think that I've known that I've had a connection like that for a long time. I just didn't know what to label it. And even when I was learning to talk to my own intuition, I started out by talking to God. And then many years later, I realized that I was talking to a whole universe of of beings, you know, including God. And um, for me, I don't know the names of my guides. I can sort of kind of see their faces. I know who some of them are in terms of, you know, one's uh, a Native American man, um, one's, you know, my grandmother and my mom, and there's other people. But for some people, they think like, if you don't know the names, if you, you know, that it's not valid. And I don't think that's really important. For me, it's more being open to whatever information I get and not judging it. And I also like to tell people that sometimes it feels like I'm very connected to the other side. Other times it just feels like I'm talking to myself in my head. So don't judge, you know, the quality of the information that you're receiving by the experience per se. And it's all valid. And also we are smart too. So maybe when you sit down to communicate with guides or spirit, you're calm enough that you're able to allow some thoughts and feelings in that you've been, you know, distracted or whatever and haven't been able to pay attention. So, or maybe spirit has you remember something or think of a person that relates to what you need in your life. Um, so kind of be open to everything. And if it resonates, go with it. Yeah, and Katie, I mean, regardless of whatever one's belief system is, is, it's evidential that your connection to your guides seemingly saved your life, or at the very least was helpful. You would totally save my life. Totally. Yeah. 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 That's profound. I mean, you know, this isn't just, you know, throwing guides out, whatever. I mean, you're living proof that connecting to a garden angel or spirit guide could save a life. And I, th I think for my viewers to remember that, that like as Katie's saying, and for my NDE, like I had my spirit guides, I knew them, I knew their names, but that's the one detail that's not there, but it doesn't have to be like picture perfect right in front of you. You just kind of feel, you know, this elevated awareness and, you know, just, it's hard to explain, but it's like this door opens up and you just kind of feel this uh, wind of love and guidance and reassurance and just, kind of helping you navigate things in a, in a different way uh, that, that's profound. So you know, thank you for, for saying that. But, but in terms of, and I know obviously going through what you went through, it might be hard to talk about, but I find in my work as a therapist, it's, it's an under-focused area, which is you know, body image, eating disorders. Right. Could you speak to that a, you know, a little bit and maybe yeah. where it is now is it more amplified with social media and everything going on? And how do you help people? And why do you feel this occurs from your own experience? 
So when I contacted our pediatrician, it was 1983. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm sure you'll be fine. You'll grow out of it Mm -hmm. or something like that. He wasn't dismissing me, but they just didn't talk about eating disorders at the time. I remember seeing one article in like, you know, Teen Vogue or something about it. And that actually gave me the idea to start throwing up. So, (laughs) you know, um, that being that being that, but um, I think that now it's more acceptable even to talk about mental illness, just to have feelings. Um, It's more acceptable to go to therapy, to ask for help. And for me, I can trace the eating disorder back to two things. Um, a dysfunctional family system with a bit too much emphasis on weight and not for my mom so much, but, but for my father and being bullied when I was 10, um, I went through puberty really early. So I looked like an adult female and girls are not very nice at that age. So I hated my body. I hated having curves, you know, I had hated being female and growing up and those two things together. Um, And then I went through puberty, um, didn't know it at the time, but I had polycystic ovarian syndrome, which alters your metabolism, the quick version, and can make you put on weight and have, you know, less um, tolerance to carbohydrates. So I put on 20 pounds when I was 12 and my father one day says, um, I was getting ice cream out of the freezer and he said, you shouldn't have the ice cream. You're, you know, you're getting fat. Mm -hmm. And I didn't consider myself fat or anything at the time. So I didn't want to be told what to do. So I'm like, yeah, I'm having it anyway. But the day after that is when I started my first diet and I don't do anything halfway. So I went thousand calories, lost the weight, got lots of attention. That's not sustainable. Right. Mm -hmm. So that does a number on your self-esteem. One of the interesting things about my story is, and I fortunately have been recovered for you know over 30 years, but the interesting part of my story too is that I have a daughter who's 26 mm-hmm. who had orthorexia when she was in high school. Wow. And she caught it, you know, it was a remarkable kid. She caught it and started making changes. And um, she actually didn't need a therapist at the time. Um, but now both of us are licensed counselors and we help people with eating disorders. Um, one of her specialties is neurodivergence, which can go along with eating disorders. It's really fascinating. We both have other standlows. So there's, there was some guilt in passing this down, you know, to my daughter, even though I had made such huge progress. Um, but it's really fascinating now that we both have gone on to recover and help people. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Do you think that there's like kind of like a life path or life chart where maybe that you and your daughter, you know, are somehow connected to have this mission together and there's some type of, you know, play or script involved. Is that something that you believe? Cause it just seems like, you know, just in a way like this powerful team that you and your daughter have, like, how could this just happen randomly? I agree. You know, no one can tell us for sure. Did we did we step into this path? Right. Did you make choices? You know, was it all preordained? And I absolutely do believe in personal choice because we can screw up our lives really, really well if we don't listen to our intuition. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, we've talked about that. Mm-hmm. And it, it's too, it, it can't be a coincidence. You know, there's just, too much there um, to think that this was just a random occurrence. So, yeah. But in terms of healing, you know, your body, I certainly work with a lot of my clients who struggle with this. Mm. Is there any particular tools or techniques that you have where maybe, you know, someone has a part of their body that's been ridiculed or they themselves just can't accept like what kind of things do you do with your clients to just learn how to accept the things that we like about our body and the things that we may not? Is there any like approaches that you have that have been helpful with your work? Definitely. Um, and I write about this in my book. I didn't invent it. It's Jungian, you know, psychology stuff with my own spin. But for me, the essential piece of recovery 
was learning to connect with self-acceptance and self-love through my intuition. Didn't happen overnight, dear God, you know, little baby steps. But for me, cognitive behavioral therapy or going into a traditional treatment setting would not have helped me. And I would have rebelled against that because I needed less control, not more. So starting with just, even if you can't connect with it from yourself, I always tell them intuition is like this source of um, unconditional love and acceptance. So allow it to say loving things to you. You know, allow it to step in when you look in the mirror and find fault or think that you're supposed to be a certain number or or all the things of body dysmorphia. Just allow it to come in and maybe say something nice to you. You know, maybe it doesn't matter what the number is on the scale, which is so much easier said than done, you know, but but how about maybe you're worthy of love? You know, you're worthy of acceptance and caring, no matter what that number is. You just start with little things. And without that love, self-love component, I, I honestly don't think people can really recover. And again, doesn't happen overnight. It's a work in progress. But also to authenticity, being true to you, mm-hmm. not being what others want you to be. We are all shaped differently. People of the same weight on the scale look different you know so so we're not cookie cutters we're not clones and unfortunately there's some pressure to be cloney especially with like social media with all the the filters and the body altering things and face it's like no one really looks like that <laughs> you know so right. Right. just um learning to get to know yourself even if it's just little things like making a list of things about you, your eye color, food you like, something you hate, um, what clothes you like to wear, all of these little things make up who we are. So the better we get to know ourselves, the more authentic we can be. Yeah. I mean, so much of this ties into as therapists, we know of DBT and radical acceptance and learning how to like ourselves and the things that we may not like and just finding that degree of acceptance because i say you're going to be in a body for hopefully a long time like how do you want that stay to be you know and if you like where you are you you have a good relationship with the body it's a better ride you know so you can make it as miserable or as joyous as possible and it's still the same body uh but also would you think that having a sense of an identity that goes beyond the body helps people, you know, with eating disorders or be, it's essential. It's it's absolutely essential. A lot of people with eating disorders tend to be people pleasers. Um, They tend to be very empathic, very sensitive because they often grow up in families where the expectation is that you don't tell the truth. You don't talk, you be the way other people want you to be. Um, Eating a really great way to think about eating disorders is the addiction model. It's an addiction. You know, it's a way of avoiding and pushing down feelings and fears and things like that. So I really like to put it in those terms. I think people can understand it well. And that's why the 12 step programs, you know, can work so well for so many people because it's finding the higher power and being honest with yourself and addressing the issues you need to take care of without beating yourself up. And so I think um, looking at it from that perspective is really helpful too. Yeah. And I think the goal is really love and acceptance, but I think people are facing in the wrong direction where you're never going to get that from everyone around you. People are not going to put flowers and you know call you a supermodel 24 seven. Like you have to feel that within and it's an impossible pursuit that people chase and now I think that's more amplified, as you mentioned, with social media, that you'll just never find what you're looking for. It has to start with you. And no matter what you do, I mean, you see some of the most physically gorgeous supermodels right? who get torn down on social media. So no matter what, uh, people with love in their hearts will see the good and people with hate will, will find the negative. And that has very little to do with you as are you know the four agreements really uh, emphasize with not taking things personally by 
Don Miguel uh, Ruiz. Yeah. Right, right, right. No, it's and it's true. I work with a lot of you know celebrities or people who on the on the surface mm-hmm. you would think they have like everything in the world and happy and et cetera, et cetera, and they're just like everybody else. They have their own issues. They have their own traumas. They have their own insecurities, and um, and just you know that remembering that helps me too when when I come up against my own self doubt or or whatever. Reminding ourselves that we are not a body, we have a body, and reminding what it's there for. It's not for vanity purposes, but it's a vehicle. And uh, you know, some people fall in love with these cars that look great, but they don't last long. Or some people could say, you know what, you know, I got a good car, but the intention of this car is to really house my soul in this life and to have it as long as I can and, and you know, as healthy as I can. That's really what it's about. And some people, they look physically great, but I'm sure, as you know, there's a big incongruency with their actual, you know, internal physical health. So I think if people would understand that piece, that's not yeah. about the external, but the internal, it would be, you know, significant. And perception is amazing. So my family will often tell me you would not even put a bathing suit on, even a one piece before you started pull. And I weigh 10 pounds more now because of the muscle. So I'm a physically bigger person, right? Mm -hmm. And I, not that I I definitely don't have, you know, the best body in the world. I don't even know what that means. But if I want to do the thing that I absolutely love, if I want to be stronger, if I want to accomplish things, I have to put that bathing suit, basically, bathing suit on, pull out, put, but so, you know, it's there. And I don't even think about it now. Now I'm like, ooh, what cute outfit can I put on today, you know, for my class? So the mindset is just, it's incredibly important. It's an ama- I mean, imagine, you know, being that young girl and looking at a video of yourself right now oh, on that pole with a one piece, like that girl must have been, sh- would have been shocked to see this, but it's just amazing to see what could happen in life. You know, and the problem doesn't go away just by itself. You really have to do the work and approach it. Otherwise it could last a whole lifetime if nothing internally changes. So it's amazing. Your model is amazing, you know, for others to see what's possible transformation from within. It's facing your fears. I mean, that's so much of it. And even every time I get up there, you know, or whatever, try a new trick or because I'm at a pretty advanced level, I have to deal with the fact that, yeah, I might fall or this is hard or maybe I can't do it, you know. And so it's that self challenge all the time. I think also that keeps my brain moving, keeps me young um, and makes me challenge those fears in other areas of my life, too. Yeah, no, absolutely. We also mentioned a lot more awareness of mental health, you know, and and, um, eating disorders, you know, body dysmorphia. But as we've seen right now, you know, partially because there's a lot more documented, you know, cases and people in treatment, but there is also, you know, an epidemic of crisis that's gone on within the mental health sphere, and that influences itself into other physical conditions. My question for you is, you know, why do we feel that we're we're in a crisis when there's more awareness, there's more support? You know, why do you feel that there's, con- you know, what's contributing to this to be more of a problem when we have, you know, more solutions and more awareness? It doesn't it doesn't make sense sometimes. Right. Um, I know my husband and I actually talked about this the other day, and he thinks it's because people there were always the problems. There was always the anxiety. There was always the mental health issues. But it just wasn't okay to talk about it, and it wasn't okay to ask for help. And there was such a stigma, even just admitting that you had anxiety or that you couldn't handle things on your own. So I do think that's a piece of it, you know. Um, I think that just looking at my kids applying for colleges, for example, the standards are crazy. You have to have way more than a 4.0 and be involved in every activity in the world to get considered for the top schools. Um, I think it's, you know, the expenses, people are going for more scholarships and things because it's really, really expensive. So if you just look at adolescence and that starts early too, because now I remember when I was young, if you were on a team, something you practice a couple times a week, now it's every day for hours. So there's such an intensity. 
And that creates stress. And then you don't learn that you need time to rest or relax. I just think this is all built on each other. And um, one thing I'm seeing a lot of is health anxiety. Hmm. So people being either having gone through something, not being able to get the health they need, help they need. Um, so that creates anxiety. You know, is it going to go away? Am I going to get the answers? Am I going to get heard and seen and helped and all that? Um, and also people who become very fixated on trying to solve that problem. And I get why you want to get better, but that becomes an addiction and an obsession too. So there's so much. And I, I think honestly, um, the internet and social media has made all of that worse because, oh, I just go to you know Google and Google and look up a symptom or it could be all these things. I might be dying or, you know, um, so I do think social media has made it worse. And I think too, maybe people living farther away from some family, like if it weren't for my grandparents when I were younger, who lived an hour away, I don't even know what my life would have been like. So we're living farther away. I think there's so many really interesting factors to it. Yeah. You know, we, we have more tools. Um, there's a shortage of therapists shortage of psychiatrists. Um, but, but yeah, you would think it would be better and it seems to be getting worse. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly, you know, was trained in systems theory, which I'm sure you're well aware of, which is emphasize emphasis places an emphasis on person and environment. And yeah. I think for us, we have to look at, okay, biology has not changed all that much. Neurochemistry has not changed all that much. So what are some of the environmental factors you know, that have altered and certainly this, you know, is one of them, you know, we've had a global pandemic. Now we have two major, you know, wars occurring, social media. So there's, it's hard to pinpoint one particular thing, but I think a lot of these have combined to where we are. Um, just, just combined with the concept of resilience, how sometimes we need to really work out those muscles and we can't have everyone always constantly doing things for us. We need to really work out those internal muscles. And I think there's a reliance on tech or phones or everything like that to navigate our lives instead of looking within, you know, and using those muscles to kind of manage uh, things. So, you know, it's, it's a lot, but I'm sure everything going on has really, it may be driven you even more, you know, to really help people. And I'm sure use pain to influence uh, purpose, but you know, being in the field for as long as you've have, you know, you're kind of an anomaly because you work in a very different approach. Yes. Um, you know, psychology, medicine, you know, therapy is very westernized. What would you like to see maybe more so from medical providers or therapists to really help clients to move the needle um, of progress from what you've really, you know, gained within your practice, would you say? <laughs> Wow, that's a loaded question, yeah. um, right? Um, because I do see a lot of medical gaslighting. I see a lot of people not being seen and heard. I think one thing that's desperately needed is a more holistic approach. Mm -hmm. And insurance companies will pay for you, or if you even have insurance, will pay for you to get one part of a body looked at, right? Or if you go to PT, They'll look at one part of the body, but that's all. And then if you go to a general practitioner and there's anything wrong with specific pieces, instead of looking at your whole body, they send you to a specialist that further looks at that, just that one piece, right? So you take something like Ehlers-Danlos, which influences every part of the body. There's all these weird random symptoms. It was thought of as rare. It's not. So if you don't look at everything that's going on, including what stressors are these people having, you know, what's going on in their personal life, can they pay their bills, et cetera, then you miss the big picture and you can't get to the root causes and contributors. So for me, that's a really, really big thing is a more holistic approach. And, um, you know, it's, it is challenging because that means more time with patients or more time with clients. And 
insurance companies and especially Medicaid and Medicare don't reimburse well. So you get into the financial aspect of things. But I still think that people who have the mindset of looking at the whole person um, and I think the best clinicians are really intuitive and use their intuition. You know, I don't think medical intuition is all that woo woo. What I do is pretty out there in terms of, you know, what I provide and stuff like that. But the best practitioners are really, really intuitive. Mm -hmm. And um, so just being open, you know, to using all of those tools and, and not just going by one script or one diagnosis. And this, this is the only little tiny bit of possibilities you have for that, you know, that diagnosis or treatment. I certainly agree. And I hope YouTube does not center, censor my next comment, which is really, you know, just, just, there's a lot of powers that be, that be, that are behind, you know, a lot of this stuff that's focused on symptom management, but not on functional medicine or going to the root cause, you know, and as a young kid, I was on a plethora of psychiatric medications because I was not able to sleep. I had terrible anxiety. It was, it was bad. And they put me on everything. And all of a sudden I went to this doctor, he took my blood work and he's like, Oh, you're missing, you know, magnesium taurate or you need fish oil and all this stuff. And so again, it's a nightmare to a lot of these people when you want to have continuity of this treatment, when you're finding a cure, you know, so I don't think it's 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 rooted in finding a cure for them. The money is the about the continuity of the problem, not the solution. So that's really what I found, you know, what I've been finding. And yeah, there's a lot of issues, but I agree with you that it's really about the root, not about the surface. <laughs> and I remember being really young and having these things. I didn't know I had EDS at the time, so I had all these weird symptoms. And fortunately, in Connecticut, where I'm from, naturopaths are licensed. So mm -hmm. you can go and the one I went to took insurance. And so having that holistic perspective from a year, really young age, like they picked up that I had hypothyroid, no other doctor did because I didn't fit the exact criteria on, on one blood test, you know? So they were able to like be open to a lot more things that were helpful. So that, that made a difference for me too. Yeah. Well, and I think the egos have to be pushed aside the powers that be, you know, that they have to go and you just have to focus. This is a person in front of you. It's not about, you know, your ego. It's about helping the person. And I think if more people were to work with other professionals, it would really help to get to the root because, hey, look, I mean, the car analogy is, you know, you could have great rims, but if a part of that engine isn't working, the whole thing isn't going to work. So mm -hmm. I think with clients, like everything is related, mental health, spiritual health, phys you know, it's all intertwined and I like to see more of a multidisciplinary and approach and, you know, we're starting to have some of that, but it's still, it takes a while to, to move that needle. Now I, I, I see um, a beautiful rainbow behind you, which is your beautiful book, which has gotten terrific, you know, rave reviews. And I, I've known a lot of people that have benefited from it, yeah. but you know, what really got you to start to say, Hey, you know, I need to put this down, you know, into a book. And for my viewers who are interested in your book, could you maybe tell us a little bit about your book, Heal From Within, and what, you know, they could find inside there? Yes. So as I was recovering, my, my guides kept saying, you need to write about this. You know, you're going you're gonna to be able to help a lot of people and tell your story and let them know that you can get better from this. And the quote I kept hearing, <clears throat> excuse me, from them was, with connection to intuition, self-love and self-acceptance, you can heal from just about anything. So that's been this mantra that they put in my head from when I was really young. Right. And so the book is partly a little bit of my own backstory. Um, I've also you know, healed from Lyme as well as some other things. So pretty challenging stuff. Um, it's, I wanted to teach people how to connect to intuition and how to, be able to identify their own issues. Mm. You know, so there's a lot of like quizzes and visual stuff. Um, some people get it on audio. I recommend the hard copy because there's just, there's so many like visual things in there. So I wanted to teach people how to connect to intuition. And I also wanted to kind of take them through my process of what I do during a medical intuitive reading. Mm -hmm. So there's a template in there. There's all kinds of quizzes There's information they can fill out. There's a chapter on each chakra that gets really in detail about all the things that you can do. And 
um, it's kind of, my husband calls it Katie Beach or the home game. Um, but so, you know, it's a good start. Um, and then the second part is kind of a glossary of healing. So there's specific stuff, illnesses or different conditions in there that you can look up um, and get ideas for you know, what you can do to help yourself. So, so this book isn't it's just kind of like a novel. There's a self-help component to it where readers could take a look at it and re really, you know, not you know, necessarily need to go to provider, but really finding empowerment on their own healing journey, you would say, right? Yeah, it's very step by step. It's, you know, how to use this book, um, read my thing, start with connecting to your intuition, then go to here, which is identifying all of your stuff, then, um, you know, either start at a general chakra, um, or go to your your area where most of your issues are start with that shock and really develop that and then look at the others but there's a lot of hands-on tools um i teach you know my specific techniques for like befriending your body and befriending your symptoms for example so there's a lot of really like um it's very detailed and also a lot of <clears throat> tools that anybody can do mm -hmm. and it's from my experience my intuition and from Jungian psychology so it's really a tool book and it highlights the mind, the body, the spirit, how they all intertwine and, you know, just, um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that, that's beautiful. Um, so, so Katie, um, you've really unloaded, uh, you know, a lot of your own personal, professional, um, you know, insights. Is there anything else that's coming to your mind in terms of any particular messaging that, you know, is intuitive at this time, maybe for viewers, anything that, you know, is kind of uh, what I what I like to call wood burning in the mind, you know, but anything going on, you know, that you feel that viewers really need to hear um, at this time? I think that one of the most important components to healing is, or to happiness in general, is being your authentic self. So, mm -hmm doing what you need to do, doing what's important to you, um, not caring so much about what people think, um, getting what you need and your opinions about yourself and your guidance from in here first. It doesn't mean we don't need other people because we do. It doesn't mean that other people's appointments, um, opinions aren't valid, you know, people we trust because they are. But if you're being true to yourself, then that's where it all starts because if i've seen so many people be really physically and emotionally sick when they were pushing themselves and their feelings down and that just it leads in all sorts of really bad directions but just beginning to do it just little tiny pieces like i said making that list of things about you that gets you thinking about who am I? What do I need? Is this, is this like congruent with what I want to do? Um, or is this person wanting me to do something that just feels really wrong? You know, so I feel like that's such a key component to health and happiness. And um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff about that in my book. And I help people individually too. So, I mean, to, to understand Obviously, there's a subjective, individualized nature to this, but it seems like the transformation from sickness to wellness is rooted in self-love from what you're saying. Is that correct? I believe that. I honestly believe that with all my heart. And self-love can feel like a stretch for most people. So start with some self-acceptance. Find something about yourself or your body that you can be like, okay, I like that. Even if it's tiny, just tiny little start with, I don't know, you like the color of your eyes or something. Like start with a tiny weeny little thing and and then be like, okay, well, what else might I like? And there's always gonna be things that we're not thrilled with, but it's really important to find the things that you like. And I've had people say, well, if I don't focus on what I don't like, if I don't focus on the problems, then they're never gonna get better. And I think the opposite is true, because if you're so focused on feeling bad and hating yourself and feeling sick and feeling like a patient and all of that, then you lose the happiness. 
and you lose your connections and then that becomes your whole life. It's possible to heal while not being obsessed with it, still address the things you need to address. Like when I found out I had Lyme, at first I was scared. And then I said, I'm not gonna use the word Lyme. I'm gonna befriend it. I'm gonna talk to it, still do all the things I need to do, but it didn't have to be my whole life. You know? Yeah. I mean, we just say some of the roots of our own challenges are for us to learn unconditional love towards ourselves. Would you say that's a part of the purpose behind some of the flaws that we may see in ourselves and stuff like that is to kind of learn that lesson of unconditional love? I absolutely believe that. And with everything going on in the world right now, if you love yourself and can accept yourself, then it's so much easier to extend that to others. Mm. And I come from a family of very judgy people who had a lot of issues they needed to take care of. Thank you very much. You know, so unless you're perfect, then how dare you judge somebody else? Or we're, we're like, what makes us interesting is our differences. And if we were all, clones if everyone had the same religion or the same beliefs or the same whatever like we wouldn't need to be here because we'd all be really boring so i think that self-love helps you extend it to others and that's essential right now oh my god <laughs> beautiful beautiful well katie beecher thank you so much for coming here as my honored guest we'd love to have you at any point in time for my viewers who you know want to get in contact with you, maybe are interested in a session, you know, or just want to you know read your incredible book, or you know follow you on social media, what's the best way to find all things Katie Beecher? Uh, the easiest thing is my website, Katie Beecher B E E, um, as you can see on the screen, KatieBeecher.com um, is kind of the central location, and then um, Katie Beecher Medical Intuitive on Instagram or Facebook or all the social things. I highly recommend you know following her and checking her out. It really will enhance your everyday life. Well, thank you so much for your generous time. And I know we'll be seeing you here in the near future. Whenever you want, you're welcome back on. I would love that. Thank you very, very much. I've really enjoyed it. Well, that was certainly a fascinating interview. I'm left certainly inspired by Katie's journey. And I'm sure many of you are filled with a lot of tidbits of insight, wisdom, and ways to really learning acceptance of yourself and the whole, and the whole self uh, from Katie's transformative journey. So thank you all for joining me here on the Wisdom Jacobs Ladder. It, this was a wonderful conversation that I know many will benefit from. We'll see you here next week on the Wisdom Jacobs Ladder podcast. Thank you. Mm -hmm.